We are live, Sneaker Mafia Sit Down, Episode 8. I'm Don Drew. And, and I am... Uh, there he is, introing, him, introing himself. I, I always like to intro myself. I am I'm, the Sneaker Sensei, Jay Corbin. Yeah, I'm not going to try and intro you no more. I think, don't, uh, don't, nah, you don't. You can do just it. go ahead. You can just go Thank ahead with, with your own intro, the self-intro for, for the co-host yeah, extraordinary. Yeah, exactly. Jay, what's good, bro? Nothing. Um, another Thursday. Uh... Couple, oh, today's a pretty decent day. We got two birthdays. You know, we celebrated Michael Jordan's birthday recently. Today is the birthday of uh, Lincoln High School star Stephon Marbury, um, right. form, former Nick, former Timberwolf, former Celtic, net, former son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, journeyman. Yeah. And um, fellow rail splitter like myself, yeah. Lincoln yes. Basketball. Yes. Brook, Brooklyn stand up. That's and. Right. Um, the other birthday is one of my favorite players in the NBA, a player who I consider um, – I'm a bigger fan of this player than I am of Michael Jordan. It would have to be Charles Barkley, a.k.a. Chuck Wagon, a.k.a. I'm not a role model, a.k.a. the Chuckster. Happy but, birthday, but Chuck. That, but that makes sense, Jay, because just like, just like Mr. Barkley, you are the round mound of rebound. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, so the I, body we, type probably we, is what we, did it for you. You know, I, I, I tend to think that people always look after people that is unobtainable or may not have the same physique. I'm realistic. Me and Chuck are shaped the same way. Our game on the court is the same way. Scrappy, you know, um, one of my favorite players from both on the court and his sneaker legacy is dope. Um, from, from the 180s to the, to the, to the Godzillas, to to the Air Max uh, two I mean not the Air Max the um the the uh, C uh, oh my God C B Max twos all those are my favorite shoes. C B thirty fours all those are dope yeah. shoes so he had a great sneaker legacy um Stephon Marbury started off good with N one and then it just went to shit after that what with, with the Starberry Starberry was one of those things good in concept but terrible in execution. Well, knowing, knowing Steph a little bit as a, as a kid, um, you know, he just went, he, like the shoes, he went off the deep end, tattooing his head and all kinds of wild stuff. I mean, I, so I you, don't... You, you said you used to hang out with Steph, right? We went to high school together. Yeah, we were we were cool. So did he, ever, days, yeah. did, did he make you eat Vaseline? Nah, man, I never did none of no kind of corny just, wild stuff. Just asking. But Lincoln High School, Lincoln High School produces, you know, great players. Yep. Um, Sebastian Telfair. Yeah, uh, Lance, Lance Stevenson. Lance Stevenson. Jesus Shuttlesworth. That's right. And there's a young <laughs> a youngster there right now going to Seton Hall, Isaiah Whitehead, who's a real good player, McDonald's All American. It produced it produced Fresco BK. Yeah, absolutely. Fresco is a Lincoln alum, and and of course yours truly. But but, you, but 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 that says you know just just talking about you know Bassey and, and Lance and that stuff in the day of prep schools and you know, the Oak Hill Academies and the Finley Preps, it's good to see, like, a public school like Lincoln is still putting out NBA talent, whereas yeah. these other kids... Yeah, whereas these other kids are going to prep schools and stuff like that. They're keeping it, you know... You got a ghost there? What the fuck? I don't know. It's something... Something was fucking with me behind me. But okay. we're good. We're good. Go. Keep yeah. talking. So, like I'm saying, like, in the day in the day and age of prep schools, it's good to see that there's a mm-hmm. public school like Lincoln that is keeping homegrown talent that is becoming something in the NBA. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and uh, I'm I'm proud to I'm I'm proud to, I'm proud to call Lincoln my alma mater, man. I I I loved I loved my four years there. All right, enough. You yeah, spent six, about you, you spent everybody knows you spent six years in high school, Drew. <laughs> I don't know about that, man. You, you had the same beard that you had there graduation day. Come anyway, on, um, this weekend it just passed. Uh, the infrareds in the the infrareds and the infrared twenty threes dropped. Yep. Did you pick up anything? Both. Okay, um, oh. I was un- I was unable to get both of them. Be- you know what? I passed on the, the white and infrareds, and I wanted the infrared twenty threes, but I was told by my retail connect that they were only available in New Orleans and whatever, whatever. They were a um, little wider than that, but they weren't. Um, they definitely weren't weren't easy to get. I had to I had to put the bat signal out and 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 do what I had to do. But what, uh, so so you being you having. How's the how's quality? Quality good? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like them. I like them. I showed the picture on uh, on the site on soulselected.com. I showed the picture of the white infrareds compared to 
the infrared 90s, and I thought the infrared was good. A lot of people called it pink, but it wasn't pink. I thought it was good. I thought well, it was speaking, infrared. Speaking about color, uh, you know, this weekend we have the powder blue, you know, tens coming out. Coming out. And, up. and um, you know, I was speaking to Todd, who was a UNC, uh, is a UNC guy, and he 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 informed me that that is not the official powder blue as we would think it is. And listen, blue. Todd knows, like, uh, if you guys don't follow K R V A N C H, that's our guy Todd. He's a, a great writer on on SoulSelected.com. This guy knows more about like basketball and in the history of the game and college hoops and sneakers than maybe anybody I know. Him and Kicks R Us are probably the two most knowledgeable guys I know, Jay. What the fuck you trying to say about me? No, I'm, I'm not taking away from you. You're on the fucking show, dude. I'm talking okay, about no, no. Here. Respect me. No, but Todd... Todd Pleasant yeah, company I'm, excluded. There you go. Disclaimer. Um... But like he said, and like, you know, I was seeing from early pictures that it's not really a Carolina blue. So, guys, if you have those Tar Heel, uh, you know, hookups ready to go with that sneaker, don't play yourself. It's not Carolina blue. Are you getting them, Drew? No, I don't, I don't have a single pair of 10s, and I don't plan on having a single pair of 10s. Um, what I am going to try to get this weekend is the Air Max Ice bottom, the red ones. Um, those are hot. I'm going to try to get those. Um, yeah, those are hot. The 90s, see, right? Yeah, the 90s. It's, um, I really like that shoe. Well put together. Color scheme is dope. And I'm going to see if I can pick up a pair of those. You copying anything this weekend? No, I just grabbed um, those Penny Air Force Ones from these here from One Ness. I grabbed yeah. them. Um, the toe box is suede, man. The heel counter is suede. See, that's where I was wondering. Is it suede? No, it is. It it is, and they're good. I mean, this is that shoe, an ice? Is that an ice bottom? It is. It, it dude, this shoe is good. I mean, the tongue is 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 got this material. This shoe is one of this is one of the this is one of the best shoes I've picked up in a long time. I mean, I'm really feeling this. All right, guys out there, if you're feeling Drew's new pickup, hit him up. Um, Twitter. At you know hashtag to sit down. Tell them what you feel about that. Um, we got a great I'm, guest tonight, Jay. Yes, we do. Uh, we got a really great guest. I mean, we got. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to stroke him too hard, but I mean, pause. It pause. pause, right? If pause. you think about it, though, Jay, Matt Halfill is kind of the Mark Zuckerberg of sneakers. Uh, you could say that. Yeah, not mad at Matt. I've known Matt for several years. Um, did a couple of things with him at Complex. We argued. Um, very, very feverishly over some sneakers on the top ten list. I think it was 2013. Yeah, two, no, 2012. We were on that list. Um, Matt is also the proprietor of NiceKicks.com. Yep. Publisher. And nice Kicks, uh, the, the stand, the standalone store. Yep. The brick, the brick and mortar store. He also threw some D's on the ice cream truck. Has a Nice Kicks ice cream truck that cruises around town down sure. there. Um. Matt, base, Matt is rich. Can we? Can we just? Can we Will just? We, can we, when, once Matt no, no. gets in here, we. I no, can we just talk? Can we just talk about how rich Matt is? I was going to ask him about how Matt, much money. He Matt, had. listen. Let me tell you something. When I was when I was living in L.A. during the um, during the release of the uh, the Back to the Future sneaker, the Air Mag. Remember they were having those auctions. Yeah. Remember those auctions? I was sitting about 30 feet away from Matt, and Matt was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a British pop star to bid on those things. So Matt is paid. Don't, don't be Matt, afraid. Don't, Matt, you, welcome you to the sit-down, Matt, down, no, Matt hold on, hold on. When you see Matt in the street, don't be afraid to ask him to hold something because he got it. Oh man, that was I, I remember that day. I remember hearing your you screaming louder than probably the bidding people. Go Matt, go Matt, go yeah. Matt. <laughs> how, Matt, how how Matt, much when, money, Matt, how much wait, money do you have in your pocket wait, right now? Time, time out, time out. Matt, when did you drop out? What number did you drop out of? I had my limit. My limit was thirty and that was it. Yeah, he was hanging in there, Drew, until thirty K. Wow. His wife was the his wife was his limit. That was, that was <laughs> she was sitting yeah. right there. She was sitting right there. No, no my, wife, my wife, my wife would have killed me. Buddy. Hey, Welcome. how's it going, guys? Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me on. This is going to be a fun conversation. We're going to talk about 
the retail experience. We can talk all about it. Um, we're going to try and give a, a give the give the viewers a 360 degree view on retail and the experience. We'll shed some some of the bigger chains. You'll get the boutique experience. Um, we're going to mm -hmm. talk about the site. We got a lot to talk about tonight, and we're happy to have you. Oh, I'm I, I'm very happy to be here, guys. And time it couldn't have been more perfect. I just came back from Vegas uh, last night uh, from doing the Agenda Trade Show, so get, definitely had a lot to look at from all the different brands. Um, oh, so that's it, cool. was, it was a great time. So, so Matt, you being on the ground floor of uh, <coughs> you know the, the brick and mortar retail, uh, mom and pop, so to speak, what is the state of retail right now? It's not easy, man. It's not easy, especially if you try to rely on you know just your top brands. Um, you know they have a they know they know where they are in the market, and they have a lot of clout, and you know they know um, how to run things. And you know you can't be a business that only relies on one or two or three brands. You got to be diversified, and you got to make sure that you bring the best that you possibly can bring in from every brand. But on top of that, you got to have the next level of customer service. That you know you that it is known around the streets as being the best in your city. Matt, what are the standards that you have for your shop? Oh man, well, first standard is pretty much everybody has to have worked with us. You know, at management level, has had to have worked with us for quite a while. Um, first, on the dot com side, that's one thing a lot of people don't know is that almost that everybody in that store who's working has had some experience with the dot com business and I'm talking about dot com is in the editorial side they've got to know their stuff about sneakers so that's the first thing because I can't have somebody come in and ask a question about an Air Max 90 or an Air Max 98 or a 96 even and people just have their hands thrown up and say oh I have no idea what that shoe is that's just not acceptable for our brand because for us the retail store was going to be an offline extension of our of our digital brand which we started online so I have to make sure that my people are up to date, in the know, very knowledgeable about things. But then they've got to have the best when it comes to customer service and skills and all that kind of stuff. So what? let me ask. Well, hold on, let me ask you a quick question, Matt. So if I'm down in the Houston area, and I know there's tons of, uh, you know, big chains. You know, you have your finish lines, your Foot Lockers, and stuff. What what, what would be my advantage for coming to a shop like Nice Kicks or any other boutique? Well, if you're in Houston, you're going to have to take a three-hour drive to go visit us because we're in Austin. <laughs> oh, Austin, so I'm sorry. That's, that's the first. No, 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 but that's fine. We have a lot of people who visit us from out of town. Um, actually, Saturdays is our biggest days for self-branded merch sales because we have a lot of out-of-towners who come to us and shop. Um, so what we make sure that we have is we make sure that we have something that is, you know, and that's one of the big things about being a boutique is you've got to make sure you have stuff on the wall that you can't find at your finish lines and foot lockers. And, you know, if you're only relying on one or two brands, that's going to be tough because on the release date Saturday business is very similar from store to store to store. So it's about bringing in those other brands, um, especially for us. It's in the running section. So having Saucony, Asics, uh, New Balance. Uh, we have some other great brands coming in soon like Atonic um, and even Brooks is doing some bringbacks. So, we're, you know, just having a nice diversified wall that's a different look and different feel and then, um, you know, making sure that the, that the customer satisfaction is there. You know, the people walk in, they're greeted, they feel at home, and they feel like this was worth the trip coming out to you. When, um, I, I, what, what got you into the Internet sneaker world? Like, how did you start Nice Kicks, and, and, and how did you evolve from the site to the store and the shop? Well, my first, my first, the, how I first got into sneakers was... Um, my first part in the business was I worked at a shoe store. I worked at a shoe store when I was 16 years old. It was my first job, and I haven't left footwear since. Um, how I got started with Nice Kicks was I had started, you know, well, actually, I should say Internet and sneakers was I started buying closeouts for my company called Athletes World. It's no longer around in Canada. But at the time, we were, we were rivaling Foot Locker in terms of sales. So I was buying a lot of stuff that wasn't selling in Canada but was selling well on eBay. So my first big buy was the yellow Shox XTs. I don't know if you guys remember that shoe, the Shox XT, the cross trainer shock. Sure. Um, yeah, so I first bought out all the stock I had in the store, put it on eBay. And, and I made more money on that than I had made like working for a week or so. So then I was like, okay, let me come back. And I bought everything in the district. 
Then I, after that, sold that. Then I went back, got everything in the company. So that's really where I first started with internet and sneakers was, you know, from flipping stuff on eBay. So one of the things that, you know, I guess the 800-pound gorilla in the room and mm -hmm. a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the guys on Twitter have been asking once we announced that we were going to have you on the show, and I'll put it up here on the screen. Why don't you speak a little bit about, about the, the history of the site and whether or not, I don't know if you could see that there. Yeah, I can. Um, you know, what, what's, what was the deal here? Well, the deal there is, unfortunately, like I've signed an agreement. I can't really comment about what I did and didn't do at that time. Um, what you see there is that's definitely what it was. I can confirm that was NiceKicks.com. Um, I can speak for I was young. I had a little hustle, and I got a little taste of money, and I kept going with it. Um, and that's what had happened when I was young. You know, looking back, I'm 29 years old now, about to turn 30. Definitely not the proudest part of my life. And, you know, I, I got to a point where I looked myself in the mirror and said, what do you really want to do with your life? And that's when I made a change there in April of 06. So and 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 that's where you changed from from that to the site we see today. Absolutely, I still remember the first blog post. It was a pair of the white stealth gray and royal blue um, Jordan fives. That was the first blog post I had ever done, April sixth, two thousand six. Wow. Now, 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 hold on, now, Matt. What made you put you know plant your flag in Austin, where it's not really you know, screaming sneaker culture. Like, what made you plant your flag there? You know, what made me plant my flag here is I was looking for a, you know, I was looking for a place that was kind of an untapped market. Um, you know, at the time, I was looking for just a cool place to live. You know, I was young. I was like 19 or 20 when I moved here, you know. So I had just gotten married. Uh, I wanted to be in a warm-weathered state because I my, met my wife up in Canada, and I was not having those Canadian winters anymore. Like, that was it. So, props to you guys to survive this New York winter this 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 time around. That that's something I definitely wouldn't be able to do myself. Um, but I wanted to move to Austin just because it was a fun young place to be, and there's a lot of technology here. So I, meeting a lot of like-minded people and all that. So you go from so, so you go from that to the to the current site and the and the blog as it is, and and fast forward to today, and. You guys, I mean, this is Complex Magazine here, rated the number one blog in, in, in sneakers, man. It's a, it's a heck of a come up from where you were. Oh, thank you, man. No, I appreciate that. I think that, you know, what, it says, what that says is that if you put your heart and mind to something, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, you know, I definitely look at my life and I try to, a, a word of wisdom I share with a lot of kids is that, a lot of times you make mistakes in life and it's okay to drive and glance back in your rearview mirror and take a peek every once in a while. But if you drive life staring in the rearview mirror, if not looking forward, that's when you're going to crash. So my mind is always trying to keep things forward, but look back and remember the mistakes you made and make sure that you learn from those. You know, the worst mistake is one that you repeat. The best mistake is one you learn from. So let's kind of, Jay, let's take it back to the retail conversation. I know one of the things that I've, in my career in, in, in footwear and, and sneakers, one of the things that I've encountered since diving into social media is that people don't really understand the way the vendor to retailer relationship goes, the way that um, the vendors sell. I think, I think they, the people commonly think that every item is available to buy as much and as many units as you want to buy. That's not the case, though. What no. do you talk about allocated product, Matt? Okay, so allocated product. I remember I've had this conversation. I probably have it all the time. People get mad at us. They get vexed on release date if they can't get a shoe and said, well, why didn't you order more? Why didn't you order more? And it's like, trust me. If it was, my oper if it was an open-to-buy option, I would buy a lot more product of your Saturday releases. But part of what brings people back every Saturday is knowing that it's not going to be there you know, for much longer than the Saturday. And so the brands really kind of look, they look at your account, they look at who you are, where you are, what kind of volume of business you're doing with inline goods, and that's going to determine your allocated product. And, you know, people say, people talk about general releases as though it's anything that's just open to buy, and that's not the case. 
almost all the high-end product that's a Saturday release product, almost anything with a release date on it for that matter, has an allocation to it. And it even goes further than that. There are certain shoes that are, you know, people wouldn't think are allocated product that are, like Roshi's or Freeze, or even in there are some inline stuff from New Balance that there's a cap on. So there's, you know, it, it's not it's not like any shoe you can just buy whatever you want made for your store and you get it. You know, it, it's it's all tiered. Now if they if they lifted the the gates on it and let people buy as much as they wanted, every retailer would be sitting on way too many shoes uh, and kill the exclusivity of of the product. Let me ask you a quick question. Because you don't have as much uh, buying power as the bigger chain stores, do some of the bigger companies make boutiques like yourself eat shit just to carry some of the more exclusive stuff? I mean, some, you know, people say that, you know, like, oh, you got to buy this to buy that, and maybe it's not your most desirable. I think what you have to look at is that, you know, some for a lot of sneakerheads, for the most part, sneakerheads are Saturday customers. I mean, if you look in a sneakerhead's closet, most of his stuff is Saturday stuff. And the other stuff, you know, you hear people say, oh, I'll never wear Team J's or I'll never wear Mellows, I'll never wear CP's. I have no problem stocking CP's and Mellows and other, and other Team Jordans because those are what sell on any given Wednesday and Tuesday to that customer who isn't up on the retro game. Or, you know, there are some customers, I know people don't believe it, but actually don't want to pay $170 for a retro. I stay, so, away, from, I stay away from Saturdays. Fuck yeah, that. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, Seriously. So there, there, there are a lot of customers that want the inline goods. So it's just about knowing what is going to work for your customer. And does it take a little bit more salesmanship than maybe a Saturday release? Yeah, but you know, sneaker shops are meant to sell shoes, not just be toll booths where people drop money and get sneakers. But what I'm saying, Matt, is that everybody knows in the sneaker game that Saturday is where you get paid. That, that's where the retailers get paid. But with companies, with, with the manufacturers and, and those companies knowing that, do they have you smaller boutique retailers by the balls, meaning that like if I want to allocate you this Saturday release, you're gonna to have to take in X, Y, and Z. I mean that's a that's the power that pretty much every brand has. I didn't name any I didn't name any brands. I'm just talking yeah. about in general. Yeah. But I mean on the flip side of it, as a retailer, you don't want to be an empty shelf you don't want to have an empty shelf on a Wednesday. You know, but you, you know, but sure. you know what's going. To, you know what's going to sell to your consumer. You know it will sell to your consumer. Yes, but you've got the thing is we don't have just sneakerheads coming into our doors. You know, a well, a good boutique has a well-rounded business that doesn't just have sneakerheads. Like we're located one block from the UT campus, so we're selling a lot of you know running shoes, like not super technical, but like your lightweight runners. It's been a good category for us. You know, so we we sell to that guy. We sell to our frat boy who wants the all gray. New Balance, no matter what the model, you know. So you you find your customers and you make sure you satisfy them, uh, no matter what. What has a hard time moving in your store? What 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 segment? I don't want to. I don't want you to call out any brands. But what no, segment? Uh, you know, I would say our toughest a bit part of the business right now is Vulcanized product. Um, Vulcanized product hasn't been doing as well because. There are more people. The economy is stronger, and people are willing to spend twenty or thirty dollars more to get an EVA injected uh, outsole shoe uh, rather than a vulcanized product. Whereas three years ago, four years ago, right when we started, the economy was really rough. Uh, we sold a ton of vulcanized product because it was very, it, it was a very good price point. Yeah, but Matt, there's several, there's, there's several Nike SBs that are vulcanized that are dope, that are crazy. Yeah, but now that now that Nike SB is more widely distributed, um, you know, it's not as easy as it once was to sell those products now too. Understood, Matt. I think I think another another piece here that people don't always think about is the release day product. Your Saturday product is probably some of your worst margins. Uh, you know, you probably do Nike as a brand probably is one of your worst margins. You probably make a lot more money off some of those other brands. Oh yeah, the other brands definitely kick you back better margins for sure. You get better margins on the other brands. And you have to, as a business owner, you have to think about margins. You can't think just about sales because sales are great, but it, really what it comes down to is what is your margins because your margins are how you pay your bills. And so like right now what Jay's wearing right there, that, that Grizzly uh, knitted beanie, that's been a huge carrier for us in this past season. 
Um, not yours specifically. I don't want to throw out there that everybody's got what you got, Sensei. But you know, um, you know, the knitted business has been really big for us. A couple years back, it was snapbacks. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of other you know margin opportunities for margin building um, with a store, and you have to look at your Saturday release product as this is what brings people in the door. But you got to capitalize and maximize your sales off of those individuals with your margin getters. How do you make how do you make the determination when you get with your allocated product? How much of that allotment goes to the web versus versus the shop? What the way we do it is that unless there's unless we get like a huge amount of product, you know, to where we can satisfy both cravings, what we usually do is it sells to the locals first and whatever is left over at noon goes online. So on the flip side of that, conversely, there's not a whole lot of you know your Saturday product hitting the web because the locals are buying it up, and the thing, the main reason for that is we never wanted to make it so that sneakerheads in Austin were at a disadvantage just because we had an online store that has you know a lot of people from all over the world shop. The the brands don't give you additional purchasing leverage because of the web store. Um, some do, some don't. But it with but some brands consider us to be a one door who has online authorization. They don't consider the store. They don't consider the online store as additional retail doors. Interesting. Now, one one thing I always talk about, uh, Matt, and this is like a lost art, and that's a uh, retail relationships. So, um, you know, having that that relationship with your local retailer, and it being one of the easiest ways to obtain. Those Saturday releases. Um, how do you feel about that? Is that a lost art? Does it still exist? Do people take the time to get uh, you know relationships with each other? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got some of the greatest kids who come in, um, and adults too. You know that have built relationships with us from the beginning, and we know them all on first name basis. You know, like we know everybody who who like who comes in. You know our regulars, and we we like the guys. Greg, our store manager, is such a great people person. He has so many phone numbers in his phone. You know, when there's a shoe like that that might come up in a passing conversation, he'll make sure to give them a call and say, "Hey, guess what just arrived at the store? You know, you you want me to get this for you? That kind of thing." So See, that's I, that. I that's the shit right there. That's the shit. That is yeah, I mean, what it's about. That's yep. the way that I look at it. Is I had this great conversation with a guy from Walters. Um, I forget, his name is escaping me right now. But he, what he told me, and you know Walter's legendary store, been in the game fifty something years. Like they know how to do it. And he mentioned it this way. He's like, you're connected. Your local sneaker shop is like your barber. You have a you have that connection. You build that relationship with him. You trust him on his insights on things. And you never want to get away from going to your same guy. You know that is your dude. You always want to make sure you take care of him, and he takes care of you. And it's a you know a, a beautiful two-way street. But I do think that we've got a younger generation coming up that doesn't know that craft yet because they are so they grew up with not knowing anything other than buying online, RSVPs, Twitter bots, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that the younger generation is missing out on that. Uh, Matt, I think that's a great point. I mean, I spent. I spent years bringing donuts and coffee to everybody on my lines. Uh, right. You know, I, I mean, I was doing that for years, and I, I love hearing you talk about that stuff. How did? How do you think social media changed the interactions between your shop and your manager and your team and yourself and your customers? Social media is huge because with with one tweet, almost anybody you can get in contact with. I mean, before it used to be. You know, because I don't work in the shop that much. I'm usually in the office. We have a headquarters downtown that that I work from for the dot com and ecom business. Um, but it used to be that back in the day, if that owner wasn't there, the only way you could get in touch would be like to call up, leave a message with a manager, hope the message the message gets over to the owner, and that kind of thing, and a follow up. But with Twitter, people can just drop me a quick line and you know, they can get access to me or they can get access to one of my managers and get that instant response. Um, and I think, too, the other thing that's great about social media is that people kind of can see that they can see who you're communicating with and who you have relationships with, and they can see how you carry yourself with customers. And I think that's a very valuable thing. 
I agree. I think the, I think that social media does create a certain transparency. I want to ask. Speaking of that, I want to ask you about something. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of taking it back to the site through social media. I guess the world was kind of exposed uh, maybe a couple months ago to uh, interaction you had with Nightwing uh -huh. um, regarding the kicks on court stuff. Um, yes. I was just, as we were getting you on the show, I was kind of reading through some of it. I'm going to put some of it up here. I, you had that press release. The infamous yeah. Matt Halfell size 11. Yes, press yes, release. yes. By the way, yeah. that, was, that was genius. That's how I want to sign my name. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how I sign all my emails. So I figure, you know what? If I'm signing this kind of thing, why not make it any different? And there it is, right there, Matt Halfill, size 11. So talk a little bit about um, about that and what happened with Nightwing. Well, I mean, there's to, to me, what happened was, if in my recollection of it, is all of a sudden I was getting railroaded for for doing something. Uh, you know, I, I I saw a YouTube video where someone said that we were going after him, that we had filed a cease and desist, and all this. I'm like, yo, what is everybody going crazy about? We filed for a trademark, but we took absolutely no action. We had done absolutely nothing at all. You know, we filed for a trademark to protect the name Kicks on Court and its use for its online purposes, which was showcasing amateur and professional athletes and the sneakers that they wear. You know, nowhere in the trademark application did it claim that we were the first to use that name in commerce. You know, that was done by SLAM back in like 1996 or 97. You know, we were only wanting to protect the use of the name as it applies. You know, that's the thing I think a lot of people don't understand about trademarks is that it's not like somebody can just own the trademark for X and that gives you global coverage over every use of that trademark. You have different classifications and different categories and all kinds of uses that you can use that you apply for and we applied for a pretty narrow thing if you ask me and it was nothing that impeded upon his business and frankly you know I didn't really I, you know we we were completely taken aback that it had be had it blown up into something like that so that's why we just said you know what we're just gonna write a press release and put it out there for everybody to understand well I, I think that everybody you know for the most part people that are in the shoe game that do, you know from the resellers down always you know, a self-proclaimed hustlers, and I hustle, I do this, I do that, but some of them should really concentrate on being businessmen um, because it's it's the business sense that not only keeps you in the game but makes you profitable, and I, and I think that people confuse, you know, a business move with, uh, you know, just like like the homie handshake, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, right. you know, you, you, you have to take care of business. I learned that the hard way. I think the other part of it, Jay, is... And, and Matt is that Nightwing's incredibly popular um, through his YouTube channel and what he very, does. And, very, very. Yeah, and I think that, and he does a great job, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that his popularity and his fans, if you want to call them fans on YouTube or the people who right. support his product, I think took your um, trademark application as a direct shot at his site and his production. But you know what, but, 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 you know what but, you, but you know what, Drew, I don't, you know, at the end of the day, and, and I'm just, you know, like, I, I love Nightwing stuff, at the end of the day, like, people can't misconstrue a business move as, like, a personal jab. Like, that's a business move. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes, you know, business is perceived like that, but at the end of the day, it's a business move. Now, if, if you, and I'm not singling out this guy, but if you conduct your business in a in a way that's conducive to a to a business, then those things can't affect you because you handle this shit at the beginning. And I'm just throwing it out there because you know I got caught on that with a name that I just thought because I was first to market with it that it was cool and someone already bought the, bought the bought the domain and did that shit and then called me up and tried to sell it back to me. So I got caught. So you got to take care of your business. Leave yeah, no it was strictly a business thing. It was in no way personal. I mean, I read one tweet said, "Why would? Why did we try to take Nightwing's livelihood?" I mean, that couldn't be further from the situation on it. I mean, in no way were we trying to take anything from anybody. We were strictly making a business move, and with business moves come business responsibilities. And you know, filing for trademarks and knowing your rights within the law is part of business. And I mean, I, if if people knew how much money we had spent on that column on 
George flying all over the country interviewing these athletes, I think they would see things through our lens of, okay, you do have to kind of protect what you invest in. So, so Matt, you won the, um, you won the trademark. You, yes, it's been it's uh, been granted as far as I as far as I know. I think that's it right there. I pulled it off. You need, man, the internet's a crazy place. You can just get anything. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. So you you won the trademark. So how do you, how do you think you're going to use that to uh, to go forward? I mean, we have no intentions of using it in any way other than just to protect what we've built. That's what that was the sole purpose for applying for a trademark. Okay, so so the yeah. plan is for you and for you and Nightwing to both continue to use the kicks on court in the different ways that you use it and continue to go forward? Well, we, he never used it the same way we used it. We never had an issue with him using like using that name in that same way. You know, he was doing performance reviews for kicks on court. We were talking about amateur and professional athletes wearing sneakers. Gotcha. Makes sense? Yeah. I have, uh, I got another one for you. Jay, you got anything from that? I know that. So, <laughs> well, well, why don't we see? Why don't we see if we got guys? Why don't we see if we got any uh, questions or comments? I'll go to the the hashtag, the sit down. See if anybody has anything here from Matt. Um, <clears throat> any questions? You know, you know, what bugs me out. Um, and this is just something about you know we talk about the internet. Is like you know if we if we if this was a drama filled show tonight. And we were trying to bombard Matt or do something like internet be going crazy right now. We're actually having oh, a knowledgeable. Yeah. We're actually having a knowledgeable conversation. You know what? And 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 it's and it's crickets out there. So you know, it's it's kind of funny and and, and and kind of sad at the same time. But Matt, let me ask you a question. Um, you've done it. Um, there's a lot of guys that are successful with um, either selling via Instagram or websites. How does one start their own brick and mortar? What are some of the obstacles? How would you get started? The, the, biggest, the biggest hurdle for starting a brick and mortar, unfortunately, is capital. And it takes so much money to get started. And what I always recommend people do is to get their business plan started. And before you go and you sign that lease and start that business, make sure you've made some connections with people at different brands to know they're going to sell to you. Um, that's something that I did early on. Before we even went forward with the project, I took you know some reps by my my pr prospective space to make sure that it would fit within their brand, um, that this project fit within what they were wanting to do as a brand. Because the last thing I wanted to do is go open up a store and then have no brands that want to sell to me because either I'm too close to somebody else or you know it doesn't fit with their model and that kind of thing. Um, but you know the it's a very capital intensive business. Um, you know it, it's very expensive to get into, and that that's just for the build out. Then you get the whole thing of buying your size runs of product. You know because you have to buy every single size from seven and a half up to fourteen, and down in Texas up to fifteen. So you know that's a whole lot of shoes on every SKU. How do how do you um, you know is is the account part like of if it, is it Political? Is it like how does like what's what's the process? Okay, listen, I got a space. It's twenty five hundred square feet. It's in a prime location. Then what do I do? You you got to get in touch with the brands and to start to politic. You know, I I, I don't want to say politic, but you know, rub shoulders with the with the right people who make those decisions. Um, I had a lot of good fortune. You know, it, it was easier on me because I had the blog, so they were already familiar with the name Nice Kicks. You know, so when I came to them and said I wanted to open up a brick and mortar store, you know, they had already known who I was. They already knew how I conducted business and that kind of thing. So, I think it, before you get into wanting to opening up a brick and mortar, you kind of have to get yourself a little bit visible in one way or another with your brand. Matt, um, what about the relationship with your site and, and with Complex? How did you get? How did you get affiliated with Complex, and then how did you dis disassociate from them? Uh, we were the first sneaker site uh, with them. I think we were actually the first or second site that joined with them when they formed the Media Network in 2007. Um, and that was we were reached out to uh, Joe Lapuma uh, was you know was asked like what are some of the top sites in hip hop and um, sneakers and girls and streetwear. 
and they had a short little list, and we were, uh, you know, Joe Lapuma, much respect to him, had us on that list. Um, so we joined. We were the first one with them, um, and you know, uh, you know, ran with them for six great years. Um, and then again, just for business decisions only, business reasons, nothing personal, no love lost. Um, we've decided to join with uh, Woven Digital. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, Matt, you said you, you, you know, you started off digitally. And the blog was a huge success. And anybody in, your, in a managerial role has to have some of that uh, blog experience. Um, I have a question out there from somebody uh, that asks, any advice for people like me who wants to write about sneakers for a company as widely recognized as Nice Kick? How would somebody uh, go about getting a job or being a contributor to like uh, your blog or your site or any site? Good work gets noticed. Um, if you just fire up a blog spot, and you know, start putting some stuff up there. Um, tweet it to me or tweet it to one of my writers. It'll get noticed. I mean, a lot of stuff that I discover and a lot of talent that I discover for the site um, gets noticed by just scanning the blogs, searching for things. Um, you know, I, I've met one individual just recently who's doing some great work, and we want to work something out with him. Uh, and he just he just tweeted me on on uh, Twitter and said, "Hey, take a look at this." So one of the one of the questions. This is a couple of good questions here we got from from people. Um, one of them is that you and I, you may not be able to talk about it, Matt. But one of the questions is somebody says that there was an agreement that you made with Nike um, regarding regarding your site. Is 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 that true? I can't make a I can't make any comment about such agreement. Unfortunately, that there okay. is one or what was in it. And what? And here's another one. What's this? This is a good question. What's your view on the secondary market and on reselling right now? I think we're in. We're very much like 2007. This is probably the biggest bubble I've ever seen, and it's going to pop. You've got so many people who are buying shoes uh, with money that they either don't have or borrowed money, uh, and they're flip and they're trying to flip them. They've got these arbitrary value valuations on their products. Um, and at the end of the day, it's gonna, you know. But a lot of the, a lot of the ways the kids are buying the shoes is with the profits that they've made from flipping the product. And the second somebody stops paying three hundred dollars for a retro release Jordan, um, you know that that came out for one sixty or one seventy, well, that's a bunch of money that's taken out of the market for that kid to reinvest into buying shoes to flip. So I, no, that's but, good. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, so I just think it's it's kind of you know secondary market, and then you've also got a dangerous situation with, um, you know, a lot of people who were involved in the business that I can't really discuss or are involved with the early release product. So you know, there's a the secondary market's very dangerous right now. There's a lot of people like I just saw a post where people talked about that they had bought a pair of Yeezy twos. Um, and early, and then they bought a pair of Yeezy 2s. They were fortunate enough on Nike's store to get them, too. And it was just through very careful inspection that they found a difference between the two. But well, you've got Yeezy 2s floating around absolutely everywhere with questionable authenticity. And yeah. it's not just Yeezys. You know, Ray Allen 13s were supposedly this super released shoe, but, God, I've seen probably more people with those for sale than were ever produced. Right, and the numbers, the numbers don't match up. Uh, one thing I want to I want to talk about, Matt, is that um, I was fortunate enough to work with you um, during your uh, New Balance fifteen hundred release. Remember, we threw that party at the Beat Store for the oh, release. Oh yes, that um, was my next question. Um, how how did that come about, and how does one go about, you know, getting that collab? You know, we see it very it's very popular now with companies like like Concepts and the Ronnie Fig stuff and. You know, you were one of the first people I actually had an opportunity to work with with that. But how does that come around? How do you pick the model, and what's the benefits of that, and what's the downfalls of that also? And who designs yeah. it? Yeah, and who designs it? So on all of our collabs, well, our first our first two collabs were done in conjunction with Ronnie when he worked at David Z. So my first collab ever that I had done on a shoe was the red, uh, the almost all red Gelite three. Uh, and that one we just that I designed with Ronnie uh, back in gosh man 2009 maybe 
Yeah, it, it, and then it released in 2010. Um, so time has flown by on that one. Um, actually, I'm wrong. It came out in 2009, so we designed it in 2008. Um, but the way that it kind of that project came about was Ronnie was work. You know, he had similar to Complex. He had found like three uh, sites that he that he really liked, and he wanted to do a special project with. So he reached out to me and said, "Hey, would you like to work with me on a shoe?" And you know, without question, the answer was yes. Um, so we, you know, put, hit pen to paper and started, you know, catting up the the Gel Light Three because that was really the only model available at the time to work on. So that kind of made it easier for selecting the model. Um, but I kind of wanted to tell a unique story with it, and so did Ronnie. And you know, we had some hidden elements of the shoe. Um, like the stripes had an underlay of 3M that you didn't know about unless you took a picture of them, and then it would light up. Um, so we had so we had a lot of fun with that project. I love um, that. I love that shoe because the shoe looked very basic and clean in the box, but when you hit it with a flash, it, it was ridiculous. Matt, don't yeah. you have a collab coming up with New Balance now? Yeah, we have a collab with New Balance coming out um, during South by Southwest March 14th. It's coming out at our shop. Uh, and then March 29th worldwide, um, and it's inspired by a beach I used to go to all the time as a kid. Um, I grew. I one thing a lot of people don't know about me, or sometimes they've seen me talk about on Twitter, is that I used to live in Grenada when I was younger. Um, Grenada down in the Caribbean, not Grenada, Mississippi. Um, and so, yeah, little tiny town, big different place. Um, but uh, so I designed a shoe, the New Balance 19, uh, New Balance 1600 um, Grand Ans. Uh, based on Grand Anse Beach, the water there, the sand, um, it, we went all went all out. Every panel has a, has a reason and a purpose. Um, there are hidden elements on this shoe that we're not again not going to photograph, so that people will only get to experience the true beauty of it, just like the beach, seeing it in person. So, Matt, well, Matt another question came in from um, Syracuse five one six. He wants to know what is your idea about super fakes. Like the super perfect is getting into retailers, and a possibly possibility that it could pass inspections and, and eventually get into your door. They won't get into my door because I only deal directly with the brands. Okay. Not a chance. I don't touch anything secondary or anything like that. Would, so have, have you ever that's... have you ever had an opportunity to see one of those super perfect sh shoes? Oh, I've seen them. I've seen them before. They're, they're, at, they're, 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 they're getting good. They're getting good. They're very good. They're very good, and like I'd said before, people who were in the business back then are still in the business today. They're just making stuff that people can't tell the difference on. Matt, I uh, I got a question here um, from from one of the viewers. Are you planning on opening uh, more shops or a second shop at the very least? We've we had a couple conversations uh, with some people in Vegas about that. Um, you know, at the in short term answer is no at this point, um, but long term answer it's definitely going to happen. We're just waiting. You know, we've had a lot of opportunities come to us. People have wanted to franchise the name um, and you know do like an athlete's foot franchise model and that kind of thing. We're just like it's got to be done right. You know, we I put so many years into this, uh, and so has my wife on on Nice Kicks and building Nice Kicks what it is online as well as you know, in store that we would only open up additional locations if it makes sense for the brand. Okay. Jay, you got one for him? Uh, let me see what else is buzzing around the internet about Matt. Someone says, Matt seems too chill. <laughs> what's his <laughs> go-to <laughs> go sneaker to stand out? Matt, oh, you're too man. chill. My go-to sneaker to stand out, well... In Vegas, I was rocking the 1600s just because I, you know, they came in the day before I left for Vegas. I'm like, you know what? I've team got to early. Win. Yeah, yeah, team early. Team early, <laughs> but but from the brand, so it's a little different. Team early. Oh, shots fired! Shots fired! <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I know my shit's straight on that. Um, but you know, other shoes I love to wear. Um, I What's love your favorite? USA, What's your balance. favorite shoe? Um, my favorite shoe, I have one answer for that. It hasn't been designed yet. All right. Well, I got a question for you. Name a shoe, Matt, that hasn't been retroed that you think should be retroed ASAP. The Air Max 96. A lot of people don't. That, 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 
that doesn't ring bells in people. Tell me why. Because to me, that was like after the '95, like in '96 when it came out, I was still wooing over the new colorways in the '95. And I think that's why it got lost in the shuffle. I think had they just done, you know, the '95 just in '95. I think the 96 would have had a better legacy. I think that it got overshadowed by the 95 still being on the wall, that this Air Max 96 that came out just kind of snuck in and went away. Same thing happened to the Air Max 98, which is finally coming back, which I'm so happy about. Um, Air Max 98 is probably my third favorite shoe of all time. Um, and the 97 was still on the wall, and they, were, and they were continuing to bring out 97, so the 98 got lost in the shuffle. So I think the 96 and 98 are two of the greatest that haven't, Return. Matt, what's your mount? Give me your Mount Rushmore kicks. I did it. I did it for for the site on Soul Selector. What's your? Give me your four. My four have to be. Jesus, it's tough. I think you got to put Kobe on there, from his days of Adidas to Nike, MJ without question. You know, I'm just gonna put that one out there right now. But 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 for the last two is really tough for me. I, I want to say LeBron as another one, and then the last, jeez. Oh, I mean, how do you not leave off Penny? But if you, but my problem is I love, you guys were talking about it earlier. I love Barkley's and and David Robinson's kids. I was going to say Barkley has to go up there. If we look at it as a body of work, a body of work, not just one particular sneaker, but we're looking at bodies of work. Barkley, uh, then definitely. I would then I would say Charles Barkley. I would say Charles Barkley. Yeah, I, I, mean, I did it. I did it a little different. I put Stan Smith. Okay. Chuck Taylor. I put Air Force One up there, and mm -hmm. I put I put the Jordan cement the not the cement three but the Jordan three silhouette as yes. my those were my you, four. Well, you're talk, you're talking about you know Andrew when you say that, um, like I would have to take away the the Jordan three. On the Mount Rushmore, because I see what the Air Force One stands for. I see what the with the with the Chuck Taylor stands for. You got to put a Puma Clyde there. That yes. that shoe that shoe was so revolution. It, first of all, it was a Puma basket, but it because of the suede on it made it a, like it was it was like the real deal. It was it revolutionized the signature shoe game. So you have to put it there. You know, well, Chuck Taylor. People think, but Chuck never played. You know. You know, you know, his things up in the air. Was he, he wasn't really a professional basketball player, that, so it wasn't really the first signature shoe. But Clyde definitely goes in the book of having his the first signature shoe. That's fair. Well, actually, though, actually, though, there's a lot of there's a lot of debate on that because Bob Cousy played in the NBA and he had the Bob Cousy All American by PF Flyers. It came out in the fifties. So I, I heard about I heard about that. Yeah, and it, and, and it's a debate. You know, what it's I'm saying? a debate. But the thing about the Puma Clyde, though, is Clyde, the, the Puma Clyde, that signature shoe, was done in, to embody who he was on and off the court. Right, right. I mean, That's he, why was, he was the epitome of the word swagger 30 years before the word was being used. Yeah, we're talking about pulling up to the garden in a Rolls Royce. And a with white length, wall tires. Yeah, with a full with length. White wall tires. Yeah, with a full length mink coat, like, you know, <laughs> brim, brim and everything. Like, you know, this is before the NBA had you know, dress rules. Like he was, people were coming in there with sweats and Clyde was just like the real deal. And, and, and what Puba did, they said, well, we have to put an elegant skin on this because this is what Clyde is about. And it was right. kind of the first time that you saw um, somebody, you know, design a shoe that was on the court, you know, good and off the court. And what that shoe what role that you played in in the building blocks of hip hop, as far as like break dancing and b boy culture, that you it, it just went through the seventies and bled right into the eighties as a mm -hmm. b boy cultural thing, you know. Yes. And then when you look at Puma as a company, with you know with Ralph Sampson and those guys, like they had a pretty good roster, you know, back in the day. Mm -hmm. Matt, can you show can you show us can you show us the New Balance? Do you have it? I don't have it with me. I dropped my pair off at the office. He's lying. It's on his feet. No, it's, <laughs> no, it's not on my feet. It's not what, on my feet. You, I'm sorry. I don't have it with some me. Of the guys, some, some of the guys in the audience are asking if you got something handy you can show us. What do you, what do you got good over there? Oh, man. Well, I got something. Sad, that, Cal Phil. No, man. I've... <laughs> 
actually, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I might have the samples. Let me go look. Give me, give me two minutes, okay? Go ahead. Go. We'll, we'll me, me and Jay will chop while, while we'll, he goes. We'll, 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 we'll bust down your, 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 your Mount Rushmore. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think Air Force One definitely gets on there. Um, Paul McClyde. Yep. The, the, the Chuck Taylor was is kind of like a cop out because it was just there when nothing else was there. It was it's still camp. relevant it, today, though, it, Jay. That's a that's that that is a forever acceptable barbecue shoe. Yeah, it's and, and it's also you know number one shoe amongst gangbangers in the in the eighties and nineties. Um, you know, but it it is what it is. Um, did they was it a it wasn't had to do, it, there was no identity to it. Like, you know, to this day, nobody out there could pick Chuck Taylor out in the lineup. You know what I'm saying? If Chuck Taylor walked by you and smacked you in the face, you wouldn't know who the hell he is. That's true. Who out there knows who Chuck Taylor is? Let me know. Send it, post a picture if you ever seen Chuck Taylor. Let's see what Matt came back with. Okay, so I found I didn't have the pair that I wore to Vegas. I have another pair that's slightly different from what's going to come out at retail. But Let's you probably see. won't be able to see it on camera, so I'm not that worried about it. But here it is. Is that suede, Matt? Talk, talk about the fabric. Suede. Big skin talk about suede. The, the fabrication. On the 1600, the SL2 last. And then here, I'll give you a little preview of the tongue. Hopefully the light will pick it up. But it's reflective, and it's reflective, made to show the waves of the water. Any any 3M besides the tongue in there? Any? Um, oh, yeah, the whole shoe. All the underlays are 3M. So where you see mesh, it's actually 3M underneath the uh, mesh. I can yeah, see it. Pick, see I can see it picking up a little bit. Yep. That's, a, yeah. that's a that's a clean shoe. Um, Thank me and you, bro. Drew, me and Drew are going to give you our addresses. Yeah. Uh, offline. And um, thank you very much uh, ahead of time. Yeah. No, Matt, no doubt, guys. No doubt. No doubt. I definitely get you guys taken care of on that. That's, that's a good, that's a good that's a good looking shoe, Matt. That's a hey, bad, thank you, man. And you know, I'm Matt, if you don't follow through with 10. that. If you don't follow through with that, the slander on social media is going to be wild. No, no, no. no, no. Can, you know, can I, can I, can I tell you something? Matt did follow through. Like I got, he, he does. He's, he's good at, he's good at that. He, he's bad at other things like returning phone calls and texts. Oh, he, I knew I was going to walk into that. <laughs> but he's good with, he's good with delivering sneakers. Listen, Matt, I really appreciate you coming on tonight. I think th you did a great job. I thought, listen, I don't think we had the. Um, the drama and the and the craziness that we had last week and with the intensity, but I I tell you I thought this was a really one of the more educational shows that we we did and I thought you did a great job articulating some stuff and Thank touching you. on some things that may be a little delicate for you and and, and your Thank and your you. site. I, I prep for the drama, so if we want to go into overtime, we can go into no, after no, no. hours if you no, want. No, to. I'm just saying, no, no, you know, the, I'm the, ready the, for it. The, the, the <laughs> thing about the thing about Matt and we talked about it last week uh, with Kicks and Guys, like you know, if, if something happened, the best way to handle it. And I use the uh, parallel in sports. It's just, you know, say, you know, let the people know what happened. And after that, you can't say nothing. It's the people out there that try to hide and deceive. And, you know, we all, we all have a past. We all did some fucked up shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Whether it be that fat chick at 3 a.m. Or, <laughs> or, you know, selling super, or, or selling super perfects and telling people that they're real. You know what I'm saying? We all did. <laughs> You know, we all got our skeletons. But you know what? If you did, just tell them, yeah, fuck that fat girl. And, you know, I won't do it again. But, okay. <laughs> you know, I, was I was living in the moment. But, uh, Matt, yo, you're dope. Thank you for coming on. I hope yeah. everybody out there got what they wanted from Matt. He addressed everything that you guys put up to us. He did a he, great job. You know, he did a great job. Did it like a true professional. Um, what else? He's on the hook for... Me and Drew on those new new, new balance. We, right. we know that. Um, and everybody everybody that's watching this that is in the business world, it is now appropriate to add your shoe size to the auto signature on your email. Right. Oh Matt, Absolutely. someone so someone just hit me on Twitter and said that they're in they're in Austin on business. What is your um address? They want give to it out, Matt. Give give give, yeah. give out the site. Twenty eight fifteen Guadalupe Street. In Austin, oh. Texas. Yes, yeah, in Austin, Texas. Texas. And for anybody who's not already Already, go check out nicekicks.com um, and go check out the site and and see what Matt and his team are doing and uh, shop nicekicks.com and every once in a while they have some good deals on there, fifty percent off and all this other stuff. So um, go check them out. And and Matt, again, thank you very much for coming on. You've been you've been hey, great. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you guys.
All Drew, right. another, another good show, Drew. Yeah, I thought this one was good. I thought, you know, I, I hope people I hope people found value. I thought... You I thought, know what? There's, there's going to be some sucker mo- motherfuckers out there going to be like, oh, man, no drama. That softball. Uh, Sensei and Don Drew yo, throw yo, softballs. Yo, those, no, it's about education. Like, what we want to do in our mantra is always is to educate and evolve. And, you know, with drama, you got to have some pieces. That's educational. Um, and I hope people out there can appreciate this. You know, because next week we got a show for you. Um, we do. We're we gonna do the, we're gonna do the easy show next week, right? We're gonna try. We're gonna try. Uh, we invited Joe Lapuma. Um, I don't know if he's gonna come on. He says he's got to check his schedule and see if he can make it. Because yeah. in my opinion, there's nobody that can that can do Yeezy justice like Joe. And we and and everybody will get to meet. You know, Soul Selector's very own Jake Pulver, who is uh. Yeezy's number one fan. He, and we will, call him a fanboy. No, no, no. Jake, Jake will stab you over Kanye. He and, will. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's it. You know, he's about that. He's about that life. Um, yes. Me personally, never lo- love his music. Think he's a musical genius. Um, don't like the shoe. Never owned a pair. Never will own a pair. Um, just doesn't have the DNA. No excitement. Doesn't bring back any memories um, to me. And it's just like uh, we'll save it for next week, Jay. Yeah. Week. All right. I, I will, but I will hoop in a pair of Yeezys. And if y'all, you know, y'all think I won't, I I'll go to a gym and hoop and shovel my car out in a pair of Yeezys. But you know, to, to put them up on the pedestal that they are right now. Um, nah. So so next week we're gonna do the Yeezy effect and kind of touch on the subcultures and the overlap of oh also music also. With speakers. Also, Drew, you know, the Internet's a powerful place. There's a certain person that you and I spoke about that we're trying to get on the sit-down, you know, our, our, our cuisine. <laughs> yeah, we want to get we want to get Renee Graziano from Mob Wives, VH1 Mob Wives. We want to get Renee on the sit-down. You know, Renee, we, if, you're, if, you're, if anybody who knows Renee is watching right now, because we got to take the sit-down to Dominic's on Arthur Avenue. Right. We're going to have a live sit-down there. Live Dominic's. sit-down right before we do the Baltimore Sneaker Show. We'll do the live sit-down at Dominic's and Arthur Avenue and get some food and 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 talk to – see if we can get Renee to sit down. Now, a lot of people think that Renee doesn't know, but people don't understand that Renee Graziano is a hip-hop stylist, or she used to be a hip-hop stylist. And we need to get Renee to, on the show. We, got a lot used, of, we could ask Renee used, a lot of stuff. She used to dress French Montana – Ghostface Killer, and a whole bunch of other dudes in the industry. So the thing that you see on my wives maybe encompasses one side of her, but I know a whole different side. I know she knows about apparel. I know she knows about footwear. Yep. The show is called The Sit Down. Everybody anybody... watching, if anybody's watching, tweet at Renee Graziano <laughs> right now and tell her you want to see her on The Sit Down <laughs> with Don Drew and Sneaker Sensei. Live, off the air. At Dominic's, at Dominic's, having a little, having a little food, a little manja manja, and some vino. And, and on that note, Jay, have a good yeah. night, buddy. You too, brother. Matt, thanks again. <laughs>